Hi, thank you everyone for joining me and welcome to MLCon. My name is Tyan Hines and I'm a senior technical product manager at Zulily working in the search space. Today, I'd like to talk to you about balancing product and customer signals to improve e-commerce search results. One quick note before we get started, I am available to answer questions during the presentation. So please feel free to ask questions in the chat. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, very quickly, I'm going to go over search intents and just talk a little bit about what that means and how that impacts what we might do in terms of search relevance. And then I'm going to go over two particular uh, things we might take in search. We might look at semantic knowledge and use that to improve search relevance. And then we'll also look a little bit into using historical data to improve search relevance as well. So let's talk about what I mean by those search intents. And these are just the different ways that somebody might interact with your site. And knowing what these search intents are can really make a big difference in terms of how you might handle your particular search relevance problem. So let's start with a few. Browse is one per perfect example. A customer is using search to casually look for something without a specific item in mind. Think of this as sort of the online equivalent of uh, window browsing. Um, another really good intent is needle. And that's where the customer is looking for a specific item, or they may have a very specific intent in mind. You might also have heard this called spear phishing. Uh, navigation is another really common way that people use search. Customers might be using search to find a specific brand, a category, an event they're looking for, help, all kinds of different things. And then, of course, customers also use search to refine a particular item that perhaps they've searched for before or that they've reviewed recently on the site. And I've provided some examples here of, of different kinds of searches depending on the intent. But how do we really get information about what intent a customer has? There's many different pieces of information that we can use to really identify the intent. For example, we can look at the search queries themselves. You can see looking at some of these examples here that when we're looking at browse, it's perhaps a little more generic in terms of the search queries that we're looking at. But you can see for the needle intent, they've typed in a very specific item that they're looking for in mind. We can also look at search results themselves and the customer behavior. If somebody is typing in something like spring dress, we can look at what kinds of items they click on, what product detail pages they go to, and what other actions they take. And that also gives us a little bit of understanding about what they're meaning with that particular uh, intent. Customer surveys are a great way to figure out how customers are using search. This is really helpful if you're having trouble sort of understanding what customers are doing. Sometimes just asking them really makes uh, all the difference. And then, of course, you can look at engagement and funnel metrics about search if you have that information. It can be really helpful to know what additional actions people are taking uh, once they've uh, administered a search. And of course, this all allows us to sort of identify the best solution or solutions for the intent that you're trying to target. So, for example, if we're trying to improve navigation, that might actually be more of a UI issue rather than something that you would want to do in terms of search relevance. Uh, if you're trying to help people with refinding, showing recent searches or recently viewed items can also help with that. So there are many, many things to consider before getting started when once you've identified the intent or the intents that you're trying to solve for. For example, you have to consider your product selection. The size of your catalog definitely influences the choices that you might make. The solutions that you would want to put in place for a very large product catalog is going to be very different than one you would put in place for a smaller one. You might also want to consider whether your product catalog is very stable or rapidly changing. If you tend to offer the same products over and over again, that's going to be a very different solution than if you have a new product on the site every single day. What kind of data do you have available? Do you have really rich product data? This is really critical for some types of shopping. For example, if you're uh, working in a very technical space, you might have a lot of information about the products that you're selling. Think about somebody like Granger that is selling um, things like nuts and bolts. They actually have really detailed information on their product detail page. And that information is also in their search to allow customers to really find that information. You might also want to look at customer data. This includes both behavioral and demographic data. If you have it on your customers, that can give you a lot of information about what you want to do. Um, of course, search results metrics, what kinds of things are happening in your search. Um, and then any sort of aggregate historical behavior data that you might have that also can tell you a little bit about what's happening in search. And then, of course, knowing what kind of trends are happening in your particular business or space right now is really, really helpful. You also have to consider what resources you have available. So, for example, what kind of skill sets do you have on your team? 
Some teams have a lot of uh, knowledge in things like artificial intelligence and machine learning. So they might choose to use more techniques that, that require that skill set than a team that maybe just has more analysts and doesn't quite have that full uh, skill set. It's also really important to know what kind of platforms you have in place. Uh, some of these solutions require managing quite a lot of data. Uh, many of them have to support uh, lots of machine models, machine learning models that use a lot of information. And so really having platforms in place to be able to properly support that is really, really important. And of course, you have to know a little bit about the timeline that you have in terms of search improvement. If you need to make really quick, immediate changes, it's going to be a very different choice than if you have a little more time to kind of develop something. And then it's always helpful to know where you're starting from in terms of search and how healthy your search is. So for example, are you returning a lot of zero search results? If that's the case, you might choose a different solution than if you're returning plenty of search results, but maybe the order is not very good. You can also look at things like click rate or click position. For example, if you are presenting 20 results on the page, if people are consistently clicking on the first, second, or third, or even first result, you're probably doing a pretty good job of presenting things in the right order. However, if people are clicking down towards the bottom of that 20 or going to the next page, that might tell you that you have a little bit of a problem in, in terms of how you're ordering your results. And of course, always things like cart ads and conversion rates are really important because for most of us, what we're trying to do is, is drive conversion rates for our company. So let's take an example from Zulily. And I'll kind of walk you through some of these decisions and how this plays out in Zulily specifically. All right, so let's just talk a little bit about Zulily. We like to talk about how we're a new store every day and that we have thousands of products of un at unbeatable prices. What that means is that we're really trying to provide a rotation of selection of products and that we're trying to make sure that we're providing those products at the best price possible. We also focus a lot on creating what we call an inspired discovery driven experience. That doesn't necessarily mean people are coming to our site because they have a really specific purchase intent. We're really trying to cater towards the customer that wants to find something that's really interesting and unique and delightful. That doesn't necessarily mean that we're trying to sell them a very specific item or that we expect them to even come to our site knowing exactly what they want. Uh, in order to accomplish that, we focus on providing really highly curated sets of products. We do have 9,000 plus new products every day, but we have a team of merchandisers that works very, very, uh, you know, very hard to make sure that we're presenting really high quality, excellent products every day that are going to really appeal to our customers. And then, of course, we also focus very much on mobile first. Um, and in order to do that, that allows us to um, make sure that we're a daily destination. So we want to make sure that people are coming back on a regular basis, looking for those great finds and those hot deals. Um, and we do, I think, a pretty good job at that. As you can see, 74% of our orders are via mobile. So how does this all translate into a search problem? I really wanna hone in on that inspired discovery driven experience. Now that, now that we know that, let's take a look at these particular intents again, right? And hopefully this will kind of lead you to realize that what we're really focused on in terms of search relevance on Zulily is focusing on that browse search intent. So what does that really mean? There's many ways that we can solve a browse. We can do something called semantic query understanding, which is really trying to understand the different pieces, the grammatical pieces of the query itself to understand what our customers are looking for. We can look at his historical data. We can use personalization by understanding our customers to present things to them that they would really like. If we have really rich product data, we can use that to influence the results that we're presenting. Uh, we can also use product similarity. We know somebody has been really interested in a particular product in the past. We can present them with something that's similar uh, that's not exactly the same though. And then of course, business logic is always really important. And that has been really critical in this last year because business logic is where we can bring those trends and that interesting information that maybe a model can't quite handle. We can bring that into search relevance. And one thing I wanna mention is for the purpose of this talk, I'm gonna mostly focus on um, the number of items returned, but all these solutions work really well at, at, in terms of ordering items as well. All right, so let's start with that semantic piece. Why do we really care about the semantic meaning of a search? There could be misspellings, and this is quite common. Something like leggings, if you only spell it with one G and you're not really paying attention to misspellings, you might actually really miss out on a great opportunity to offer your customer leggings that they're looking for. Search terms can mean multiple th things. When somebody types in Lily, do they mean the brand or do they mean the flower? When they type in apple, are they looking for the fruit or are they looking for the brand apple? There's different ways to split words. When we have loungewear, does it actually mean the same thing if it's one word versus two, or is that the same concept? 
Uh, what search means depends on external context as well. So for example, time of year, what kinds of events you might have on your site, uh, your customer's location. In this particular case, Zulily focuses in on mom, um, external events that are happening in the world. So for example, masks mean something different in the Halloween season than it does in the rest of the year. And I think we can all agree that masks definitely mean something different now than it did say 18 months ago. If we only do an exact match, Customers have to spell everything perfectly and they have to understand how your search system works just to find anything. Well, customers are really busy. I mean, especially now when the lines are really blurred between home and work and people maybe have kids at home and they've been working on schooling and perhaps they're trying to take care of pets. There's a lot going on. Understanding the semantic meaning of a query really helps us better direct customers to what they want. But how do we go about doing that? Do we do something that's very manual or do we take a more general approach or something like NLP, natural language processing? So let's talk a little bit about manual. It allows you to fine tune search very deliberately, right? So you can say for this particular query, these are the kinds of results that I want to show. This is really good if your inventory is small or if it's rel relatively consistent over time. It also works really well when the type and number of queries themselves are very small. Um, but obviously, this is not terribly scalable, especially if you have a larger inventory or you have a larger number of in, uh, queries. So then you might want to look at something like nat natural language processing or some other more machine learning approach. This works really well when your inventory is large or if it's constantly shifting. It doesn't always require regular fine tuning, which can be nice if you don't have somebody who's in there like checking new queries or new product types. Um, and it can cover a wide variety of use cases. So it can be a little more responsive to unexpected changes. Within reason, there are certain kinds of large scale events, say a pandemic that even NLP cannot solve for. Um, but unfortunately, in order to implement NLP, this requires specialized knowledge and tooling to implement. So if you don't have those particular resources available, sometimes it can be a real challenge to get started in NLP. So what do we do if that doesn't work? Well, we can also see what our customers have done in the past, and we can use that to help us. So for example, certain queries may have very specific context. The word snap card cardigan actually means something really specific on Zulily. It's this particular type of item, it's extremely popular, but probably on most other e-commerce sites that doesn't really have any meaning. It helps us understand ambiguous queries. Does Apple mean the brand or the fruit? If we look in history in the past, we can see that customers tended to perhaps search for Apple and then they went and they chose a device. So that tells us that for most people, Apple actually means the company, the brand. Adding a time component can allow us to identify seasonal trends. So remember I mentioned masks. If we look at that and how that particular query changes over time, we can actually see that in the Halloween season, masks mean something a little different. And we can adjust the product selection that we provide during Halloween to make sure that we're really providing customers with what they want. So here's an example, two examples of, of what you would get from a mask search. One is very relevant right now. It's still kind of the, the non-medical masks that we are still wearing in some cases. And then of course, uh, during Halloween, you might be more interested in say like a Minecraft uh, costume mask. And then adding geography is also another really quick way to what get to what we call kind of quick personalization. So for example, in the fall, sweaters will trend in the north before they do in the south. So we can kind of predict some trends and we can tailor our selection based on where the person is in the country. So historical clicks allows us to see what click customers have clicked on in the past. So we don't have to guess what they mean, right? So looking at previous behavior helps us understand those search queries and better direct customers to what they want. Okay, so that's great. Let's talk a little bit more about, let's kind of sum up some of these historical signals, right? It's really good for context specific understanding, helps us understand those ambiguous queries. It's really easy to add other signals to personalize, but it's not all positive, right? Not, for example, it relies on consistent product selection. So if your product selection is really consistent over time, you can rely on those historical trends to really tell you what it means. But if your product selection is changing over time, this can be a real challenge because masks may mean something right now and it might've meant the same thing last year, but if your product selection is different, that can actually force the, the queries to mean something different. And then of course, it just assumes that you have historical data. So if you have not been collecting data on your searches or your product selection, or if you're a brand new site, using something like historical signals is not necessarily going to be kind of helpful.
So let's kind of compare that a little bit to what we, oh, and also it's not necessarily responsive to trends. So this is another challenge, and this is actually something that many companies have run into this year. Um, things changed during the pandemic and people actually had very different shopping preferences and were looking for very different things. Toilet paper, for example, if you'll remember at the beginning of the pandemic was a big thing and many sites didn't really sell that or it wasn't something that they really optimized to present because that's something that people went to the grocery store to buy. And so they just didn't really make a big deal out of it. And when all of a sudden that was not available, that actually became a very popular search trend on many e-commerce sites, even though they'd never seen that as a query before. And of course, looking at historical trends, you would have never guessed that that would have been the case. Let's compare and contrast this a little bit with semantic understanding, which I mentioned earlier, right? Remember that semantic understanding allows you to fine tune that search very deliberately if you're doing something kind of manual. And you can also use an NLP approach, which is also really good for scale. But of course, as we mentioned, because it's hard to scale things like the manual version of semantic understanding, that can be really hard if things are changing a lot or if you have a really large product selection. And then of course, NLP requires really specialized knowledge and tooling to support. So ultimately what we wanna do is take some sort of combination of all of these. So you can imagine that perhaps you would wanna do manual tuning for some queries and then others you might wanna use NLP. And then you can use historical signals perhaps for pieces of your, your product selection that are really consistent. And combining all of those approaches together allows you to create a very specific search experience for your customers. So the important thing is, is this is not a one size fits all, nor is it a single solution that you have to choose. You really have to think about all the different ways that you can put these approaches together to really craft a good search experience. And you can, divide this up many different ways. So I had mentioned that perhaps for one query, you'd want to do manual tuning, another NLP, another historical signals. You can also slice out a different direction. You could, for example, just look at information that you have about customers. And you might say, hey, this particular set of really loyal customers, we want to use historical signals for more of their, their search queries because they are very consistent in what they want. They're regular customers. They come back, they buy the same things. Right? Perhaps for new customers, you want to be able to use more of an NLP approach because you don't necessarily know what they want because they're new customers and they might have kind of a wider variety of customer behaviors until you've sort of learned that. And then perhaps for some very specific customers that come in from perhaps a particular platform, you might want to manually tune that because you know customers that say come in from TikTok behave a very certain way. And so you are kind of manually tuning some queries to respond to that. So there's many different ways that you can mix and match these approaches to really create the best approach for your particular use case. So I hope that gave you just a little bit of an overview and kind of how we would use these different uh, techniques to really help improve search relevance and how it's really a balance between these different kinds of signals. Thank you very much for joining me. Uh, if you have additional questions, please ask them in the chat or you can email me at thines at zulily.com. Please enjoy the rest of the great content at MLCon. And thank you so much.